Hi everyone, I'm Lori with Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary. Today is Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020. The following video is an interview that I did with one of the Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary board members, Angeline Canny. Angie is not only a board member of the Equine Sanctuary that I direct, but she is also a personal friend and a former classmate. Angie and I got our degree together in zookeeping technology and she has gone on to pursue her bachelor's in wildlife biology or something akin to that, which she'll explain in the video. And she is about to start her master's degree. Angie's story is very inspiring. And every time I speak with her, I always come away from the conversation feeling good and feeling inspired and feeling like I can tackle things that before talking to her, I wasn't sure that I could. So I hope that you enjoy this interview. We aren't really an interview type of channel, but occasionally if the interview is educational and if I feel that it can have an impact on the lives of animals or on the lives of people working with animals, that's the kind of content that I want to produce. So please enjoy this interview. It's about an hour long. And until next time, please remember to always be kind and love your animals. Well, first, I just wanna go over how we know each other. Mm -hmm. So Angie and I met in college when we were both working on our applied science of zookeeping technology degree. We were both in school at the same time and in the same program. And we finished that and I have gone on to pursue further training and degrees in behavior and animal health. And Angie has gone a little bit different route. What route have you gone? Um, I'm currently working on my bachelor's, my undergraduate at Colorado State University in Pueblo um, for natural resource and wildlife management. Um, it kind of runs along the same lines. It's less behavioral though and less animal centric and more about managing populations and things like that conservation ecology stuff now is that what you set out to do or is that something you just fell into <laughs> honestly i don't <laughs> i think back on it and i don't really know how i ended up there i kind of just i remember googling it when i was in class in the associates program and just kind of being interested so i went down there and i talked to uh dr claire ramos who is one of the professors there, and she's uh -huh. the wildlife director. And I don't know, she just was really nice and really convincing, and I just signed up right there. And okay. then since then, I've worked with her from then on. So let's back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. What made you start the zookeeping program in the first place? Did you always know that you wanted to work with animals or do a degree with animals? Because that applied science of zookeeping technology degree, I think there are only five or six in the country. Mm -hmm. And it's a very specialized field for people who work at zoological institutions, sanctuaries, wildlife parks, that type of thing. And it was a very, I liked the program. It was mm -hmm. very applicable to what we do at our animal sanctuary here. And I think it's a good stepping stone to other things. So did you seek that out or did you just fall into that as well? Um, I did seek it out. There was one in Florida. I was living in Florida in 2016 and there is one in Gainesville, but it wasn't an Associates of Science. It was just, um, I forget what it is. It's like a certificate of mm -hmm. science or something, but it wasn't a degree. And I always wanted, you know, to further my education. And at the time I was in kind of a transition period of getting out of the army and then trying to get back into school and like regular life. So, and it just kind of worked out where it was either Colorado or Washington state is where the other one okay. is. And then the, uh, the rest of them, I think, are actually just certificates. They're not actually right. associates programs. And I knew that potentially I might want to do a bachelor's. So I just, and I had, I had lived in the Springs before because I was uh -huh. stationed at Fort Carson. My friend was getting out and it just happened that she had a room available. And I just, I, I made <laughs> the decision in three months. I packed everything in my two-door coop, two dogs and a cat, and all my clothes, and got rid of everything else, and moved from Florida to Colorado. Wow! In the like three months later. Okay. That so, was it. Wow. So where did you <laughs> see that going? Did you want to work in a zoo at that time? At that time, um, no. Honestly, 
I was, I always leaned more towards wildlife rehab. Okay. I really wanted to do something like that or do something along like that line, a nonprofit organization. And then as I got like my associates, it became clear that it's really hard to get into that kind of mm-hmm. situation. It is. So in the zoo situation, I don't mind zoos. I have no issues with zoos. I think that they're great. Obviously, they're a need for society and for the animals that they take care of. But it's just not something I see myself doing long term. So then I just decided to do the bachelor's. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're almost finished with your bachelor's, right? Yeah, I'll be done in May. And you have worked very hard at that, I know, because I've been watching Mm -hmm. you along the way. Angie... After we met in the zookeeping program and graduated, Angie, well, no, before you graduated, you mm-hmm. did internships mm-hmm. at the same animal sanctuary that I direct. Mm-hmm. She did two internships here yep. and then joined the board of directors sometime later. She mm-hmm. volunteered here after her internships were done, and then now she's on the board of directors. So I've known Angie now about three years, and we've become closer. And I've watched Angie sometimes struggle with school and overload herself, sometimes taking too many classes because you have this drive to finish. Where is that coming from? Honestly, it's a lot of it's a lot of me feeling like I'm getting older and I need to get some stuff done, and it's also (laughs) a lot of. Being at that school, I'm con- it's considered a STEM program, mm-hmm. so the science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, so they really push 16 to 18 credit course loads there because we are STEM. So they, my degree actually has more than, like they have a similar one and it's a recreation degree. Mm-hmm. So basically it's like outdoor recreation and it's I think a year less, but it's, okay. a, it's a bachelor's in the right. same way. But I have more credits, so it takes a little bit longer for me because it's a STEM program. So your yours is the Bachelor's of Science in, what is the title of it? It's kind of like a wildlife biology degree, I yes. know, but they call it something specific there. It's Wildlife and Natural Resource Management. Okay. So it's applicable to, like, if I wanted to do wildlife biology for my master's, general biology. It's pretty applicable in ecology master's. It's, it's really kind of a catch-all. And so you're close to starting your master's. I am. And yeah. I thought, you're crazy. You just, you're just you just finishing your bachelor's. I know yeah. it's been time consuming and stressful, yeah. and now you're starting a master's program. Yes. When I are am. you starting that? So I'm starting, actually Thursday I have a meeting with the people I'm supposed to collaborate. They work in uh, Idaho. Yeah. Idaho, and it's, um, she's basically looking at public perception about golden eagles and while why even though in america we are very uh america the bald eagle mm-hmm. etc there's a big tie psychologically to like pride for americans but yet they're getting killed at a high rate and they're going basically extinct because of human poaching wow so we're gonna look at uh, a lot of the human dimensions factors, which is something I'm super interested in, the psychology of uh, understanding ecology, why people relate to things the way they do. That's something really exciting and like at the forefront of what I've always wanted to do. I just never knew what the okay. name was. Um, so I think that's why I'm doing my master's because that's an option for me. So what will your master's be in? Human dimensions of biology. Oh, it will. Mm-hmm. So that will be, okay. Wow. I know. That sounds really complicated. No, I'm excited. (laughs) Okay, well, that's good. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you've maintained your drive to follow through Mm -hmm. despite roadblocks, because I know you've had many roadblocks along the way that may have caused other people to drop out, to quit. And those include, I think, everything from some health things to just psychological stress to having to move this past year to some remote learning, which I know from personal experience is difficult with science, Mm -hmm. very difficult with science. Um, My biology class that I was in the middle of went to remote learning and it was really difficult to move to remote learning for a class where you normally had labs and in-person contact with uh, instructors and professors that you could ask questions to. And it was tempting to quit and to just throw up your hands and say, okay, this is really hard. I'm not able to interact with my professor in the way that I normally can to ask complicated questions because science isn't easy. 
were not able to do hands-on learning mm -hmm. and it it would have been easy easier just to say forget it I'm dropping out but I paid for it I was determined to finish and I just took it one day at a time but you've kind of run into these things throughout your whole degree because mm -hmm. you have a lot going on how have you persevered <sighs> honestly <laughs> it's just me being stubborn kind of <laughs> and pushing through it because I know at the end after all this work it's just a pattern of you go through it, you push through it, you do the hard stuff, and in the end, you get the reward. And that's been a lot of my life. Mm -hmm. So I can recognize that, yes, this sucks. Yes, this moment is hard. But in six months from now, when I've graduated or when I have this degree or when I can get, you know, the job that I want, is it going to be worth it? And, you know, I just keep coming back to the, yeah, it's going to be worth it. And it's hard sometimes, it's really hard sometimes to get to that place when you're just in it. Mm -hmm. But I kind of have to, I'll give myself a break, I'll take a step back. Even if it's due at midnight, I'll take 30 minutes and stop, even if it's 11. <laughs> I, I have to email my professor. I've been, I've been lucky in the fact that a lot of my professors are very understanding. Mm -hmm. So if I need, you know, an extra hour for an assignment, they'll give it to me. So not everyone is that lucky, and I I don't ask all the time, definitely. It's just <laughs> certain situations, but I've been really lucky in the fact that I have a lot of professors that want me to succeed, mm -hmm. and they I can openly go talk to them about, you know, whether it be psychological, medical, uh, emotional, whatever is going on, or something like dumb, like I got a speeding ticket or something. Mm -hmm. They're very understanding, where a, I think a lot of people aren't. But you did run into some issues with some professors in the beginning because I remember you yeah. talking to me about the attitude of some of the professors yeah. like your freshman year. Yes. So those those professors are not professors that I've kept as mentors. Mm -hmm. um, I specifically am talking about like three probably professors I've had for the most in my course load just because they're they're the head of part of the program yeah they're part of the program and those other professors that I've had issues with I've always just had to go talk to the my mentors or I'll go talk to those professors and whether or not they are willing to work with me or not I have to kind of remember that they are in charge of mm -hmm. at the end of the day they're in charge of the grade I get and whether or not they're going to understand or not doesn't really matter I just have right. to get it done Right. So it's been, yes, it was really hard freshman and sophomore year, especially because you get a lot of those professors that are, you know, you're only going to have for one class, but mm -hmm. that class is terrible. <laughs> and it's just something that like microbiology was really hard for me to wrap my head around because I'm just not, I'm not yeah, interested I'm not in micro, <laughs> which, which is, it's not meaning that micro is terrible. It's really interesting if you're interested in that. And it's super important. It's super important. It's extremely especially important. now. And, yeah, but it's very difficult. It's difficult. It's not my thing. Yes. And so I had to just come to terms with the fact that I'm going to get a B in that class, and it's not going to be my A class. Mm -hmm. And that was also hard for me. But I just kept, you know, coming back to my mentors, the people that I have a bulk of my classes with, the people I know, you know, from, you know, personal, school, professional experiences, and they know me better, right. and just talk to them, and then, you know, go about the situation, how I'd ask them, present the problem, they'd give me feedback, and I'd, you know, whether or not I took the feedback or not, and just got mad instead, it didn't really matter, I had to get it done. So you just have to put up with that stuff. But it does get better. Junior and senior year are much better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned to me before when we were talking that you never thought that you would get here. Or you mm -hmm. never thought that it would be possible to do the things you're doing. Mm -hmm. Why Why did you say that? Um, honestly, I come from a really low income family. So that was one hurdle that I had to overcome. So I did that by joining the military okay. and getting school paid for. Um, and I always just... I don't know. Nobody in my family has ever gone to college. Uh -huh. My mom went for like a semester and dropped out. My dad, I helped him get a GED when I was in high school. Wow. Yeah. So it was just, I never, I, it was not something that was presented to me as an opportunity, an opportunity because my parents never did it. They didn't know how to do it, you know? So it's just, 
I had to figure it out myself. And I did that through the military. I took four years, cut it out for that, and then the rest of it's dedicated to me wanting to get either further my education or not, but I right. gave myself the option of doing either. So you went in the military right after high school? Yes, one and, month after. And you spent four years in the yeah. Army. Yeah. And what was that experience like? Um, <laughs> it was, wor- like like I said, sometimes you have to push through it to get to the end so that it'll be worth It's worth it now because I get school paid for, books paid for. I don't have to stress out about taking loans out. When I get out of right. my master's, I'm going to be out of pocket for one semester. That's awesome. It's amazing. And if... There was no other plan. (laughs) (laughs) That that was it. I enjoy the Army to a degree. Uh I definitely recommend it for people who feel lost after high school and don't know what they want to do. It gives you a lot of that structure that I have now that makes, I think, makes me successful in the situation that I am. So do you think that spending that four years in the Army has helped you be in a better place to start college than if you had started college at 18 or 17 or 19 years old? Yeah, I was definitely, um, I was 18 and I acted 18. And (laughs) I think that if I would have went right into college, I probably would have done the whole do the bare minimum, get C's and go have fun. And, you know, while I do have fun now, it's definitely giving myself that time Mm -hmm. to kind of figure out and chill a little bit let my brain kind of make those formations where I'm not doing things that are putting me in danger all the time or things it definitely makes me more responsible and it makes me respect the process of school more otherwise I would have just went in like a normal 18 year old well and psychologically does it I think it probably helps you cope with the stressors yes. that maybe people right out of high school aren't ready to deal with yes I agree not none of this is life or death and for a lot of people like I see that came out of high school this is life or death because they went from high school to college and now you know the grade is so much it's important in high school but uh-huh. it's much more important in college so they're you know ripping their hair out and whereas I'll I'll resign to, okay, this is going to be a B class right. because that's the amount of communication I'm getting from the professor, right. et cetera. And Bs for some people are life or death. And, you know, I've seen people have complete panic attacks on finals wow. week, midterms, all of that. And, you know, while I get stressed about it and I don't enjoy taking tests and things <laughs> like that, and I do worry, I know at the end of the day, I'm not going to die if I get an F. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll have to retake a class and that sucks. But it's not life or death. I'm not going. I'm not getting shot at. I'm not. I'm not getting yelled at. <laughs> yes. There's no. But yes, I would agree with you that I think a lot of people go into it and it's life or death, and they have no other perspective. Right. So it's harder for them to calm down. Well, and also, and I even saw this in our applied science um, program when we were in the zookeeping program. There were some people who dropped out. There were some people yeah. who ha- failed and had to retake classes and they had an unrealistic expectation of what that program was going to be Mm -hmm. they took it because they liked animals yes I like animals I want to work in a zoo or something and so I'm going to take this zookeeping technology program and then uh, the science kicked in the Mm -hmm. workload kicked in the internships kicked in the labs kicked in and it was a lot more physically and mentally demanding than I think many people thought Yes, it's a commitment. School is 100% a commitment. It's my life at this point. You know, I have he, I have bits and pieces of free time, and usually that free time is either sleeping, <laughs> eating, or doing some kind of homework or studying. And I think that at 18, I was not ready to make that commitment. Right. I am now. I'm older. I want more out of life. But at 18, you know, you don't really think about that stuff. And you're also a research assistant. Yes. So you also have a part-time or full-time paid? It's part-time paid. Research mm-hmm. assistant job. Talk a little bit about that. What kind of research is it? Um, so last summer I looked at biodiversity of avian communities in the shortgrass prairie um, in relation to drought. So 2018 we had a severe drought. We had about a third of the average precipitation uh-huh. in Pueblo, Colorado. And it's southwestern Colorado. Um and then 2019, we had actually an above average precipitation year. So I really, I just got to look at 
the differences between a drought year and I didn't really have to manipulate anything. Wow. I just did observational research and then compiled it into a statistical analysis and then kind of presented it as it was. There was no manipulation. There was no... It was actually really fun. I really enjoyed it. I got to learn a lot of things. I was never a bird person. <laughs> and now I enjoy birding. I go out on hikes really? and bring binoculars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love all animals. I know. Except maybe flies, who are on my nerves right now. That's fair. But when I took birds, I mean, I did well in it because I made myself do well in it, but it wasn't something that interested me, and I was surprised to hear that you were doing research with birds. I know. Because you like turtles. I do. And you wanted to do something with turtles. I did, and I applied for that, (laughs) but... I think that the reason I enjoy it so much now is because like my mentor is, she is absolutely the most crazy bird person, but she's such a gentle, sweet, understanding person. And that really helped me, like, it helped me to want to, like, learn about it because she's so understanding and so patient with me. I wanted to do good for her because she was so giving to me. Well, and I think when somebody else is passionate about mm-hmm. a subject, that you it's kind easy. of get caught up in mm-hmm. their passion for that subject matter. And then when they're nice to you and they treat you well, all of that makes you want to do it more. Agree. And she's absolutely amazing. And anybody else, I'm, I'm so glad that I got her. I'm so <coughs> glad I went out of my comfort zone. And I highly recommend if you aren't, If you're looking at something like this and you have the opportunity to do an animal that you're unknowledgeable about and don't typically want to know, I recommend doing it. Go out of your comfort zone and do it just so you'll be a more well-rounded person. Now, you had to get up really early to do some (laughs) of this research, and you were, what, collecting birds and then re-releasing them? So, I was a piece, we pieced together, I was helping with a lot of pieces of, so there's master's students that are doing this, Uh and then there were other undergraduate uh, research going on, so we kind of all helped each other, and then we had our own independent Mm -hmm. projects, but yeah, so we went out, banded birds, which I am still terrible at, (laughs) I'm so scared to hurt the bird, and I hold it, and I just can't. I mean, I'm trying, though. I'm really trying. And then we would ban them, take blood samples, um, basically take uh, cloacal measurements, mm-hmm. um, and then we release them and see if we can catch them this year and the following years okay. and things like that. Um, we color banded them and also aluminum banded them so that we could map territories, which is one of the graduate students um, that I work with. He's doing like a territory thing with mm-hmm. casting sparrows. And then there was a whole bunch of other projects going on, and we just, we did, I did a whole bunch of lots of wow. netting and observ- just point counts, point counts, point counts. So a lot of different people are doing various research mm-hmm. projects around these same birds. Yes, around, um, around the short grass prairie. And then there's other pieces of the project, so there's another one that's doing mammals, but mostly uh, prairie dogs, mm-hmm. um, and doing some immune stuff with flies and prairie dogs, um, mosquitoes, anything that's a vector for the plague. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're doing that, and then there's a herp uh, portion of it, and it's basically a collective like study that they're doing. They're going to publish it in I think Southwestern Ecologist, okay. that's still up in the air. I haven't heard much of it because of COVID. I think that they're kind of like holding back and focusing on getting remote for their classes right. and things. So it's a short grass prairie project. Yes. And your part was this bird. Yes. Yes. And so but you run into other animals when you're out there in the field. Oh, yeah. yeah. What kind of other animals have you run into out there? Um, so badgers. We actually, <laughs> uh, actually, I didn't send you the picture. Did I? No. I have a picture of badgers copulating. Oh, gee. Yeah. So badgers, a lot of badgers, um, rattlesnakes. I almost stepped on one a couple of days, like a couple of weeks. So I really almost stepped on. Now, what kind of rattlesnakes um, are they? The... We have the prairie rattlesnake okay. and the mashuga. Uh huh. We have those too. Is that how you pronounce it? I think. I know. I know what you're talking about. We have them here. Yes. Like, we've seen some this year here on the ranch, and I didn't know how to pronounce it. I'm that. not sure, but it's a long S. It's a masa. I don't know if that's how you say it. Yes, but they're bigger. The prairie rattlers are much, much smaller, and the mashugas are much, much bigger. You can tell the difference. Yeah, whichever one it is. And what else do you see out there? Hog nose. We see hog noses all the time. What else? That was interesting. 
bull oh, snakes. Oh, I love bull snakes. There's a lot of bull snakes. And they always scare me because they, they kind of, if you're walking up on one, they kind of do the tail uh-huh, rattle. They do. They mimic it. So immediately my heart drops. I'm like, oh, I'm about to die. <laughs> I'm about to die really hard. But now I've never, at all, anytime I've run into any kind of snake, they immediately give me a warning. And if they don't, it's because they're warming up. Like that mm-hmm. rattlesnake, I, I really almost snipped on it. It was, it was like 7.30 in the morning. Uh-huh. So it was warming up. And I put my foot down next to its head. Oh. Yeah, no, it was actually really scary. <laughs> I put my foot down next to its head, and it was probably, like, that far away. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, no, it was scary. <laughs> so how did you, did you see it? Did it rattle? I know, it... it didn't rattle. I saw it. My next foot was about to step on it. Oh, no. So I look, because I'm always scanning, because I am uh-huh. scared of, you see a lot, I've seen a lot of rattlesnakes, especially this summer. Uh-huh. So I'm always scanning. And I looked at my map, because we have a map on our phone, to go to each point. And I looked down for a second, looked back up to go put my foot down, saw it, immediately went this way, and it lifted its head and stuck its tongue out. Uh-huh. And it saw me and immediately darted away. Okay. So anytime that I run into a snake, like the hog nose immediately flips over and they do. performs thanatosis. Uh-huh. Um, and you can, we, I don't pick them up, but some of my more wiry classmates <laughs> they will pick them up the hog noses and they don't do anything you put them back down they flip back over and dart so i've never okay. i've never had an issue with being chased by a snake they don't typically good. do that no they don't that's not a snake thing. no it's not so that brings me to when i met you mm. i think it was in the the aquarium class the fish and aquatic invertebrates mm-hmm. class yeah I don't know if that's the first, that's the first class where we really spoke. Yeah. And that's because I knew nothing about fish and aquaria. I, it was a required course that we had to take. You will never see me working in an aquarium. No. (laughs) Well, I, I guess I shouldn't say never, but probably not. Mm. And I relied on Angie a lot and was constantly bugging her and asking her questions about how to take care of my assigned tank and Mm -hmm. such. And I found out you were knowledgeable about fish, you mm-hmm. liked mammals, but you were afraid of snakes. Yes, I I am still have a healthy fear of rattlesnakes because I run into them so often. It is scary. I'm not scared of them. I just know that they could potentially kill me. But since I was afraid, I was afraid of snakes because my uncle actually got bit by an Easter diamondback. Oh, wow. Yes, he lived, thank God. Oh my gosh. But Ever since then, and that was happening when I was about three or four. Mm-hmm. I just remember the stories, and it always scared me. Um, and cotton mouths, and in Florida, where I'm from, there's a lot of oh, yeah. venomous snakes that live there. So I always just associated snakes with death, uh huh, or, or like hurting. Um, but now I def- I I'm better and understand snakes. I am more knowledgeable about snakes and their body, like, positions yeah. and... Body language. Yes, body language. And I can, you know, respect the space that they need while also knowing that if they want to come out, that's their choice. And, you know, I don't mind holding the snake now. You don't? No. Because you said with all the snakes around here that sometimes it still made you nervous. It does, just because there's so many. And as <laughs> as much as I trust your locking mechanisms, <laughs> I know snakes are crazy wiry and can get out if they really want to. But I do, I know that you have everything locked up because I know that you're very on point with that. But I still, like, when when I come to babysit over here, I do, I check everything. And she's one of the few people that can actually take care of the animal sanctuary on her own. She can actually feed the animals, take care of the animals, knows the animals. And when I have to be gone, Angie is the person that I turn to to come stay here because she's responsible. It's a very rare occasion that you leave. I ho- I seldom leave. I don't blame you, though. Because of lots of reasons. No, I know. Lots of reasons. But um, if I do have to leave, Angie comes. Mm-hmm. But she doesn't mess with the snakes. No. But I think mm-hmm. if there was an emergency, I could, I could, you I could would deal with it, or yes. you could call someone to help. Now we took herpetology. I don't think we were in the same class. I don't remember. If I you don't were. remember actually. But we had to take the same herpetology mm-hmm. class. How did you deal with that? And it wasn't just snakes. There were also turtles and mm-hmm. skinks and amphibians, mm-hmm. frogs, different things. But how did you get a snake assigned to you? To I did. For? I did. It was Bongo. 
It, it was, was bongo, the Kenyan sambo that I have now. Okay. Alex, yep, Alex, or uh, one of the professors or teachers there. He's not a professor. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> one of the teachers there, he, um, for my graduation, he actually gave me bongo. Right. And I still have her. She's old and she's sweet. So Angie, who was afraid, is semi still afraid of snakes, has a snake. I do. A Kenyan sambo. I do. Tell us about her. She is an older snake. She's a female. She's about three and a half feet, which is pretty large for Kenyan Sambo. She came to me overweight. Now she's uh-huh. not. Okay. She's doing really well. She shed perfectly for the first time last shed, which was really exciting because I've had her for two years and uh-huh. it's taken me that long to get her shed right. Wow. Yes. Because she used to get stuck right around here. Uh-huh. And that's always scary because if it gets dried up and it starts constricting, I always worried about that. Right. But this was a really nice shed. I didn't even know she was in blue. It was great. Anyways, she is a Kenyan Sambo. She's super sweet. I love her. She sits on my lap when I do homework sometimes. Uh-huh. And I let her out of her cage. I'll open up the lid. I'll close the door so the other animals can't get in. And she'll just come out. And she'll look for me. Yeah, and so that's what I find interesting is Angie... So. We finished this degree and part of it was taking her pathology, part of it was we had to take animal behavior and animal training, and that's the direction that I've pursued since graduating that program, and Angie's gone in a conservation mm-hmm. route. But when you were talking to me about your snake a few weeks ago, you're doing choice-based handling with your snake, mm-hmm. but you don't even know what choice-based handling is. Angie's just intuitively working with her snake, watching the snake's body language, and uh, using the least intrusive, minimally invasive methods of husbandry and handling. And tell us about that. And how did you know to work with her that way? Uh, you know, I just, I guess, like, as a kid, I used to, as a kid, I used to, like, pretend that I was an animal. Uh-huh. And I guess I just never stopped okay. pretending. So I always look at like my dog or my cat or bongo and you know i'm always like well if i was sleeping would i really want somebody just coming in and grabbing me up just because you know she wants to hang out with me or would i want my mom hanging out and staring at me as i sleep and Uh you know trying to get me awake for whatever reason you know if i'm coming out on my own and i want to hang out then that's a different story but i think it comes with a lot of empathy like i have a lot of colleagues in the same program who are actually done with it who definitely see animals i guess less anthropomorphic i just for me it doesn't make sense to put it doesn't make sense to make the choice for the animal mm-hmm. unless it's something like medicine and you know they can't obviously communicate right. you know that their stomach hurts but if they take them to the vet they need this medicine right and i have to force it down because they don't like taking pills that's a different story correct but i mean it's like my dog if she doesn't want to sit on my lap i'm not going to keep bringing her over and right. forcing her because then she's just going to associate a negative feeling with me and i would I would much rather there be as much positive feelings so that when time comes that I have to shove a pill down her throat, she doesn't, you know, cower or fear. And it's the same thing with a snake. I know that their brains are different, obviously, but the same concept of do you want somebody coming into your home and reaching and grabbing you? No. The answer is always no. Right. (laughs) So that's, that's just the thought that I had. And honestly, I didn't know that was even a choice or like a whole thought process of like the choice handling choice based handling choice based handling i didn't even know that i just assumed that everybody does it but they don't and i've learned right. that very very recently with a lot of the people that i work with they are not like that and it's confusing to me but i also don't it's not my place right to say so bongo indicates to you when she wants out yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she'll come up and she'll push on the, the screen that I have at the uh-huh. top. And that's when I know she wants out. Otherwise, she's underneath her substrate or I have a nice little box for her. Okay. And I put tissue paper in there. Uh-huh. And she likes wrestling through that. And is she in a sand substrate or what do you have? Um, no, I have aspen chips. Okay. I think 
from the research that I read, it's better. But I do have a little, like, um, it's like a container, and it's just a Tupperware container. Mm -hmm. I've put sand in there and let her, like, uh -huh. go in there for enrichment purposes. Uh -huh. And then I'll put her back. But for feeding purposes, they, everyone says that the aspen is a better choice. It's so that she doesn't get impacted with the sand. Uh -huh. And so when she wants out and you take the lid off, what mm -hmm. does she, she climbs out. You've sent me videos yeah, yeah. of her climbing yes. on like this little tree thing. Yeah, she, she has, sometimes I'll switch it out right now. She's got, it's just a old book, book box. Uh -huh. And she'll climb, she'll sit on top of that and then she'll push up. But she'll climb and she likes to go around the rim of the, Con, like the tank that I have yeah. her in and then I'll go pick her up when she's looks like she's about done with that and I'll put her on the floor or I'll put her on my desk uh -huh. or somewhere where I can at least look around and visualize her and see that she's not getting into something she shouldn't be getting into. <laughs> um, but yeah she she climbs she climbs along that branch thing that I have she loves it that's neat yeah so you've had other reptiles yes what other reptiles that you have uh, leopard gecko I had a gopher tortoise growing up I loved him he was cute um, and then I had another tortoise it was a Burmese star tortoise oh I, say. I don't even know what that is I want to say that's what it was but it wasn't mine technically it was my dad's he just had it and that's kind of where I started the tortoises. Okay. And then you had some, were they leopard geckos that you had? I did in the have leopard geckos. And they had issues. MBD, so metabolic bone disease. With, basically, they came from a hoarding situation. Mm -hmm. um, and the people that raided, the police that raided the hoarding situation, they found a lot of illegal reptiles and then also leopard geckos, snakes, whatever. And they had abandoned, I think it was like over 150 animals. Oh my gosh. And they had started eating each other. Oh my goodness. Because like they had been abandoned for months. Um, so the leopard geckos never got uh, the vitamin D supplement mm -hmm. that you sprinkle on their food or whatever. And they weren't getting fed, so she couldn't use her back legs. And she, her skin was so thin that you could see like oh into gosh. her bones. So I had her and she was bonded to a male. So I took the male too. Mm -hmm. And they kind of, I had them for about a year. She was doing a lot better. And then all of a sudden she just took a dive. Yeah, and I remember that it was really sad. It was really sad. She took a dive and she just started. I think she, I don't really know what happened. I know you had her to the vet several times. I took her to the vet a couple times. Giving her medications. Yeah. And... She couldn't poop. She couldn't, uh, I think that it wasn't a heat issue because I made sure that she had enough heat. I made sure she had a UVB light bulb. I made sure of all of that stuff. And I just think that it was too much stress on her body. Do you know that. how old these animals were? No, yeah. I don't. I have no idea. They could have been young. They could have been old. The vet said anywhere between like two and three years old. And then the male died shortly after. The male after. died shortly after. And I'm not sure why. It was about a couple weeks after. He was not as... He was, his MBD wasn't as progressed as mm -hmm. hers when I got her, um, but it was still pretty bad. And I think both of them just kind of, their bodies gave out. Oh, that's so sad. It was sad, but they got an extra year almost, and they would have gotten eaten by everything in there. So. And I know you've mentioned to me before about getting a bearded dragon, and then I <laughs> referred you to listen to Port City Pets podcast, yeah. where yeah. they interviewed a really, really knowledgeable and passionate bearded dragon. Yep. Yeah breeder and then you were like uh i don't think so well it's not, that, it's not that i don't think so i would love a bearded dragon but with the time constraints that i have i don't think i'll be able to give them the proper attention that i believe they deserve and i thought that was a really important point to make because lots of people think oh i want this animal mm. oh i want a bearded dragon i want a snake i want a dog i want a horse but they they don't research yeah. how much care goes into taking care of that animal properly. And you did that mm -hmm. and then realized, well, this isn't a time that I should be getting one right now, but yes. maybe in the future. Definitely in the future. <laughs> definitely in my future when I'm more settled and I have a schedule and I know when I can do these things or that, but sometimes I get called randomly and there's just, yeah, you know, there's no way. And I don't want to put an animal through that. Now, if it came to me as a rescue, that would be a different story. I would make room for it and right. do the best I, I can. I think we all do that. Yes. But right now, there's no reason for me to go put an animal through that. 
I'll just wait. So what other animals do you have now besides, you have your snake and mm -hmm. you have a dog. I have two dogs. You have two dogs. Yeah, one of them, one of them is my cousins who okay. live with me. Okay. Um, and then I have two cats and then she has another cat. So we have three cats total. Oh, wow. And then I have a betta fish. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. I have had betta fish and actually been able to keep them alive. She, I've, uh, it's actually a guy, his name is Porcus, <laughs> and he has been alive for two years. I got him in my freshman biology class. They they get him, and then Dr. Claire tries to adopt him out. Uh -huh. I had him ever since. Wow. And she, he's the only one that survived. That's amazing. I know. I love him. He's a sweetheart. And you have two dogs. One's your cousins, and mm -hmm. then you have a dog. But yep. you recently lost a dog. And I oh, just have to mention her because she is one of the most amazing <laughs> dogs because of how long she lived. Tell us she, about her. She, we celebrated her. name her. was Midnight, right? Yes. Her name was Midnight. She was a Jack Russell mix. I don't really know what she was mixed with. She was a stray when we got her. She was 24 years old when she died. I've had, we've had her since she was about four. And so I've known her for 20 years. So you were how old when your family got midnight? Oh, like eight. Like eight. Wow. Eight or nine. So it isn't one of those things where you're kind of guessing her age. Like you've had her all the all your life. Mm -hmm. She was about four or five, the vet said, when we found her. Uh, I was working. I was with my dad. Actually, I wasn't working. But I was with my dad, and he was working on a job site down uh -huh. in uh, Miami. And we found her at a hot dog stand we used to go. Oh, my eat gosh. At. And she was eating all the garbage. And she was so mean. But she, she was. She was so mean. And then she came up to me, and I fed <laughs> I fed her a piece of my hot dog, and she jumped right in the van with us. Wow. Uh, I remember that, actually. And, and then we so had then her ever you had her 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. Yeah, I cried oh, I, when Midnight died. It was terrible. Cried. Oh. And I didn't, I'd only met Midnight once or twice, but just because of her whole life story and how old she was, it was hard for me. It was hard for me too, but I have her. I have her ashes. I got her cremated. I had um, her euthanized at the house, mm -hmm. so I held her while she got euthanized, and it was hard. But I wouldn't have done it any other so way. So old. I mean, mm -hmm. that's so old for a dog. That's the longest relationship I've ever had. Yeah, I had. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. I have animals that are still with me now yeah. that have been with me longer than uh, Gem and I've been married. Jim and I have been together 12 or 13 years. Yeah. I don't even know now, but I have animals that have been with me longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, those are the relationships that sort of sustain mm -hmm. because animals expect so little of us. And, and they give a lot. They do give a lot. Mm -hmm. They do give a lot. And I find it interesting that you say that Midnight was so mean when you met her. She was, she's, um, she was mean till the day she died. She just liked me for some reason. She hated everybody else. And that's my point, because we also do dog rescue mm -hmm. and behavioral rehabilitation with dogs. Mm -hmm. And occasionally we get dogs sent here from the local Collie Rescue, Rocky Mountain Collie and Sheltie Rescue. And we have this dog here, Teddy Ruxpin, who has some poor vision and grew up on a ranch. Mm -hmm. And when... Uh, her family was going through divorce and she needed to be rehomed. She went to a new home for three weeks. It didn't work out at all. Um, she got returned. Then she was brought from Montana to Colorado and we brought her here to our ranch to foster. And she just, it was like she fit in and had been here all, always. She was mm -hmm. fabulous with my husband and I. She's the sweetest dog ever. Like, she is. And she had a history of not being that way. And then we've had other people visit and she has bitten them. We saw another side to her. Mm -hmm. But when Angie came over and met her, that wasn't the case. And Teddy loves Angie. Mm -hmm. So I think that you have empathy with animals and they pick up on that. Or I they so pick up on your body language with them. Well, the first time that I met her, I could tell that she was very anxious and she was excited because oh, all the dogs get excited yes, when people they come. Do. And so it excites her or it gets her anxious more because she can't see. Right. So she doesn't know if it's a threat. She doesn't know. So I'm sure that she's getting mixed signals from, signals from the other dogs just auditorily. Yes. Because she can't rely on her vision. So she relies on that more. So I just remember her, you know, finally getting after all the dogs jumping on me. <laughs> and she jumped on me and you, I kind of just stood there and I let her sniff me. Uh -huh. And I didn't freak out, even though a lot of people do yes. not like dogs, but I knew that she had visual impairment. So, you know, 
I'm not going to tell her to get down or push her down because that's going to scare mm-hmm. her. So I just sat there and I let her sniff me and I tried to be calm and I talked to her and I scratched her ear and then after that she was fine. Yeah, she loves Angie. Yeah, I love her. She's so sweet. Yeah. And Kiever, who was a feral dog when we took him mm-hmm. in for behavioral rehabilitation several years ago, he's really, they're all really good with you. Yeah. And the horses are too. Mm-hmm. And horses are an animal that if you, they will mirror your feelings, they'll mirror your state of mind sort of. Mm-hmm. So if you're really nervous and fearful, they're going to be really nervous and fearful. And you've always done very well with that. Mm-hmm. So I know we've talked before about how important you think it is to have empathy with animals when you're dealing with them on a behavioral level or a training level and how important that is with care Mm -hmm. as well. I agree. Now the conservation work you're doing, you deal with animals in a different, a whole, at a whole different level. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to people about this before where there's sort of these different levels of animal management and animal care all the way from the individual, which is what we do here. And that's Mm -hmm. where I'm very comfortable is caring for each individual animal according to their individual specific needs. And I treat them all as such. And then um, there are shelters and rescues and sanctuaries and zoological institutions. And then there's conservation work. And all of those different levels, you interact with animals in a different way. So like, for example, at zoological institutions, sometimes you have to split animals up, move Mm -hmm. them to different facilities in order to facilitate species survival plans. and, And you're sort of looking at what's best for the species as a whole versus the individual animal necessarily. And it shelters too. When you're working at rescues, you adopt animals out to maybe not the absolute 100% perfect home because that means you can take more in. And so there's all these different aspects of working with animals. On a conservation level, you're actually dealing with populations. Yes. So versus I'm dealing with a specific individual Mm -hmm. and I'll do everything that's best for that individual at that level, you're dealing with population management and what's best at the population level. And I know for me, psychologically, sometimes that can be hard because Mm -hmm. sometimes you have to cull animals, you have to let animals starve or let nature take its course. And so how do you deal with that when I know that you love animals on the individual level too? I do, I know. And you know, that's really hard and that's what's driven me, that is what's driven me to my (laughs) masters. Really? So bachelor's degree, you know, I could get a lot of good jobs, CPW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, um, you know, things like that. But it's more, you have to be more able to disconnect from that, mm-hmm. and that's hard for me. So I'm not going to be, if if I needed to go out, and I was just talking to somebody who actually got a do- job with CPW, mm-hmm. and he had to go out and he had to, he, they were just doing population counts or whatever, And um, he had to go out and kill a badger, a female badger, because he was looking at the uterus and seeing how many pregnancies she's had to to do population counts. Right. And, you know, that's not something that, you know, onesies and twosies, but they do that a lot. And he goes and calls raccoons, and he goes and calls, you know, and that's fine, and I do understand that, you know... If there's a raccoon that's rabid, mm-hmm. you know, definitely that's something to take care of, and that's a safety hazard. But I just, the Masters gives you a lot more leadway with being able to work at things with your own plan mm-hmm. and be more creative in the ways that you do them. With Bachelors, you kind of have to follow the standard procedures. And I'm sure with the Masters, there's going to be instances with that, and I'm not, uh, you know unaware of that right but it's just it's not something that I I'm capable of doing and that's kind of where I why I stepped away from the zoo as well Mm -hmm. because that's a lot of that too it's a lot of putting animals in situations that maybe aren't best for them but that's the best you can do right as a zoo because of funding because of space all of that right that's not something that I'm happy with and the bigger the picture becomes the less attention is paid to the individual animal yes and they're it's logical and mm-hmm. it's needed. Yeah. I'm just not psychologically set up to work with animals at that level. I'm yes. very much more in tune to them as individuals and that's where I want to be. Yeah. And for me, the nature taking its course thing, that's a totally acceptable, for me, that's, you know, if I wasn't there, that was going to happen anyways. Right. So I can kind of justify or like um, compartmentalize for me. That's uh-huh. not something that I caused. Like I didn't 
kill that animal. I'm not going out and killing that animal. Right. But if it gets eaten by something that it's supposed to eat it, then, right. you know, that's the circle of life. And I can understand that. And I get that. So that leads me into my next question, which was that is natural and that is nature and you didn't cause it, mm -hmm. but people are causing yes. a lot of harm towards animals, both pet animals, domestic animals, agricultural animals with neglect and abuse. And then on a global level, conservation wise, humans are horrible for the planet and for the animal populations on it. I, I don't yeah. think anyone would really contest that. Oh no, it's, a, it's actually funny because, uh, in like I'm taking a class right now and we're doing the human dimension it's human dimension uh -huh. of wildlife management so we had to basically write a paper and it was you know what do wildlife managers manage people or animals ah. and a lot of people you know sided with we're managing animals I think that we manage people yeah because in the absence of people they would manage themselves correct you know they would eat each other you know, reproduce, whatever, whatever. But if we were all gone, there would be no need for a manager position. It would mm -hmm. just happen. So I think that we, I think wildlife, the wildlife profession is just for managing people. That's a really great mm -hmm. point and an interesting perspective that I never thought about before. But now that I am thinking about it, I think you're absolutely right. And even here where our animal sanctuary is, you know, we've lived here since 2013 so seven years mm -hmm. and just in the past year a neighborhood has started going in mm -hmm. across this literally across the street on these hundreds of acres that are over there and it went from no homes there to now there's probably 20 homes and I think they have 76 homes planned or more yeah and I've noticed we've lived here seven years without any conflicts with wildlife we've lived here with rattlesnakes bull mm -hmm. snakes um, the prairie dogs, the coyotes, the birds, garter snakes. We've just lived in harmony with them. We don't bother them, they don't bother us. And now that this neighborhood is moving in and people are moving in around us, um, people are shooting animals, people are trying to poison animals, people are trying to get rid of these animals that they see as a nuisance. Mm. And from my perspective, these animals lived here and we invaded their territory and we're the invasive species mm -hmm. and it really breaks my heart that people can't move in and try to live in harmony with them that they feel like they have to destroy them it really really bothers me and is disheartening and i just have to not think about it most of the time because i get um very depressed about it agree but there's you know there's nothing that it's sad it is sad and i have to do the same thing i can't think about it because i'll get really upset about it but you know, what do you do? You have to vote in local elections. You have to pay attention to what's on the ballot. And, you know, that's really hard for a lot of people. And so, and most of the time, it doesn't really matter anyways. If someone wants to sell that property and it's right. theirs and they want to sell it to a manufacturer, a home manufacturer, then that's what they're going to do. But I feel like the point you made about managing people and not the wildlife mm -hmm. is is what needs to happen now is I feel like when I interact with these neighbors or talk to them that I need to try to educate them and manage how not only how they're dealing with the animals but manage how they're thinking about these animals mm -hmm. and try to get them to deal with what they perceive as a threat or invasiveness in a different way and I would agree with you I think education I think education is getting better but I think a lot of people don't care too. I feel that many people don't have empathy mm -hmm. for animals, for other life other than ours. And you've mentioned that too. So I do believe that. Why do you think that is? Um, just, you know, I don't want to, honestly. It's just speculation on our part yeah, now. Honestly, the reason that I think that is, is because the whole for survival of the fittest, Darwinism, you know, that's, in a in a high school education, associates education, Darwinism is a huge part of the curriculum for biology. Mm -hmm. And if you know people are told that, and then they're they think about themselves as being the fittest compared to like let's say me versus a coyote. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have a gun, I'm the fittest. You know, I have the tool that's going to make me more fit than a coyote. So automatically, the people I think humans as a whole write off anything that can't use a tool and doesn't have the capacity for 
picking up a stick and throwing it or a right. stone or, you know, I think people can, I think people are more empathetic to like orangutans and things like that or dogs just because we've kind of co-evolved mm-hmm. with them together. But like, let's say a snake. I know a lot of people that would just chop a head off a snake immediately without even thinking about it. And that's, that's the whole culture that I grew up in in Florida. Mm-hmm. That's what my dad did. That's what my uncles did. That's what all my friends right. did. Um, I never agreed with it. I would just walk the other way. Right. You know, and I never thought about it really. And when they did it and they tell me about it, I would never be like, I, it wasn't a thing that I thought about until I got educated more and more and was like, why are we actually killing these animals? Mm-hmm. You know, and then you find out that a lot of these animals that you're killing, like uh, gopher tortoises, for example, in yes. Florida, a lot of people think they're a nuisance species. Because they go and they don't even dig the holes. They just use right. burrows that are already pre-existing. And they provide a lot of, um, like, food and, yes. like, things for animals, other other animals in Florida, like coyotes. They're important to the longleaf pine yes. forest ecosystem, as are, like, the eastern indigo snake. Yes. And many of those animals in that part of our country that people have decimated the populations of... Um, their absence is causing detrimental effects yes. to the long leaf pine forest ecosystem. I agree. And, but people don't think about that because uh, humans' lifespan is only, let's say, 100 years maximum. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, there are some people that live to be crazy right. old. But 100 years is, like, really old for most people. So why would you think about 1,000 years from now? Yeah. You know? And I think that's, that's really where that comes from. I think that lack of thinking about your child's generation mm-hmm. or your grandchild's generation or something like that. I think that's where it comes from. And I also think people aren't thinking at the opposite end of the spectrum, too. When they're killing that animal, they're not thinking of that animal as an individual no. who has an emotional life, who has social relationships with other animals, or if it's an, a species that's not social, they mm-hmm. still have an impact on the ecosystem and their environment and they're still an individual Mm -hmm. they're still an individual and i think people aren't cognizant of that Mm -hmm. they don't think about that and they're not empathetic with it Mm -hmm. i agree so as we wrap this up are there animals that you see yourself getting in the future and do you have a dream animal that you would love to have like if you had no financial legal space restrictions what would that animal be? And then realistically, what animals do you see yourself having in the future? <laughs> Honestly, a Galapagos tortoise. Really? I would love I know one. you love turtles and tortoises. They're just so, they're dogs. <laughs> they're just, they're so cute. They're so, I just love them. I think they're adorable. They're so smart. And they live forever. And they, they're just so, I don't know. I just love them. I would sit on the couch and just snuggle on it. Your, your tortoise, your Galapagos tortoise. So are you going to get tortoises that you can actually I have would, honestly, I thought about it and at, you know, when I get settled or doing whatever I would want to do, I would love to learn, run like a tortoise rescue. Really? Yes. That's so cool. I would love to. I think that, you know, I think reptiles get a real bad rap. Mm-hmm. Maybe not turtles and tortoises, but a lot of reptiles. And, you know, coming from, I don't know, I just see a lot of people that don't treat turtles, they'll put them in this little box, and, like, that's it. And I've, I've had a go for tortoise, and he loved to hang out with me in the house, and he'd follow me around, and, you know, that's not every tortoise, obviously, right. but, I don't know, I think that would be fun. I think they have the capacity for some kind of emotional attachment. They do, and mm-hmm. I've, uh, I just did a blog post that I, I published during the night about the misconceptions in the mm-hmm. reptile community about reptile cognition and reptile brains mm-hmm. and people somehow think that they're different from the brains of other vertebrates and they're not mm-hmm. and so I just published that blog with a whole bunch of papers that have been published in the scientific literature mm-hmm. that explain the reptile brain including the snake brain and mm-hmm. they have all the same parts or homologous parts to 
the brains of other vertebrates. Yeah, they're just different sizes and shapes. They're just different sizes, different shapes. Mm -hmm. The parts are the same, but they're not going to be identical. Well, yeah, it depends on the needs. It's like birds. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the the brains produce dopamine Mm -hmm. and other neurotransmitters, the same as our brains, and they have emotional lives, just Mm -hmm. like other vertebrates, because they're able to produce these neurochemicals Mm -hmm. and they have the same brain structure. And for some reason, people think reptiles don't. And it's a detriment to reptiles. I agree. Because reptiles, I think a lot of reptiles have scales as armor, have shells as armor, can't express themselves really great with body language and facial expressions. And so then people surmise that, oh, they don't have emotions or they Mm -hmm. can't think or they're not smart, they can't problem solve, but they can. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed every day working with these snakes how much that they're learning and doing and they even amaze me sometimes. Mm And so I think reptiles get a bad rap. I agree. I think so too. So turtles, tortoises. Tortoises and turtles. That's really cool. I and they do that. live a long time. I, I always know. worry that my animals will outlive me, which is something I don't want because I don't want my animals to lose me and have to live somehow differently. That might be somehow not as good as they live here. Well, no, they're not going <laughs> to live anywhere as good as here. Yeah, well, they could. There are other people. There are other people. There are other people, but you do a really good job so far. <laughs> so how long do many tortoises and turtles live? <laughs> um, I know that the Galapagos tortoises can live up to 100 years. Some of wow. them live like more. I know of one instance that... There was, oh, I forget. I actually wrote a paper about it in our associates uh-huh. program in herpetology. And there was a tortoise, and I forget the species, but it had been through World War II. Oh, my god! And, like, it had just died in 2016. Wow. It was 120-something years That's old. That's amazing. Timothy the tortoise, I want to say, was his name. Wow. And he, you just have a picture. You see all the pictures of him from, like, That's the amazing. Ages. All was the amazing. things he experienced. I Hopefully know. they were good experiences. That's all I keep he, he, about. He, was, he ended up living with the royal family at the end of his life. Wow. Yeah. So in our herpetology lab, we had a snapping turtle, right? We did. Because I remember you doing a lot with that turtle yeah. because other people were... I wasn't afraid of it, but some yeah, people were nurturing. afraid of it mm-hmm. because snapping turtle yeah. bites... Yes, and they do have a powerful bite. And to be honest, I'm not. I was. I'm not afraid, but I respect the power that is a snap. He could yes. potentially rip a finger off or two. So, but I mean, if our instructor was really knowledgeable about the snap and turtle yes. and care for it, which was really helpful for me, and I just wanted to learn. You know that right. when's the next time I have an <laughs> opportunity to nail trim an alligator or snapping tortoise? Right. Never. It's never gonna happen. So I figured, why not? And then nobody else wanted to do it, so I just kept doing it. <laughs> That's neat. Yeah. That's neat. So where do you see yourself overall when you finish your master's program? Like, what are your long-term goals? Obviously, your short-term goal is get through school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes, I want to get through school, definitely. I guess my long-term goal, I would love to do something on along the lines of um, human dimensions, uh, wildlife and human interactions, and maybe some kind of, you know, work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. I, my dream job would be to be a, a wildlife biologist on, like, Yellowstone uh-huh. or, you know, Moab or something cool like that, but obviously, like, that's probably not the first job I'm right. going to get. Right, right. But hopefully that's my... That's my job. That's that's my long term goal. That's what I want to do. Doing field work. Somewhere. I want to do field work on my somewhere like a national park or wildlife sanctuary uh-huh. or something like that, and just you know do some stuff like that. Right. I don't know. That's oh, my goal. Cool. <laughs> so, what would you say to people, no matter how old they are? Because I'm starting my what third career now. Yeah. At, almost 51 years old. Yeah. I'm working on my third degree. Yeah. And I just keep learning and keep moving on to new careers because that's what keeps life exciting. I agree. But what would you say to someone either just starting out, they're 18 years old and just graduated from high school, or somebody who just got out of the military, or somebody like me who retired from one job and is starting a second career what would you say to them when they say, oh, I really love animals, I want to do something with animals? Well, I would definitely say vol- go volunteer somewhere. Even when I was in high school and I was old enough to drive, I volunteered at the animal shelter. 
I volunteered at um, a couple other places where we would, like, go out in the swamp and pick air potatoes and, like, <laughs> take invasive species. But that was always, like, my thing. Uh-huh. I always really enjoyed – nobody else enjoyed doing that in my family. Nobody enjoys that stuff. I, if you have a passion for it, make it happen. And I know that it's kind of annoying, and that's what everybody says. Yes. Um, but if you really want to make it happen, you got to put in the work, and you have to commit. The work and commitment is something I feel like a lot of people don't realize is involved with any kind of work with animals. And there are so many different levels that you can work with animals, from a rescue or sanctuary to a zoological institution mm-hmm. to field work to conservation work to animal training to animal behavior modification. There's all the to veterinary work yep. or veterinary assisting and, and technician work. There's all of these different aspects of it. And I feel like people kind of start out with, I love animals, I want to work with animals. And then when they get into these different situations, they don't realize how physical it can be, how time consuming it can be, how emotional it can be, because animals have things happen to them, unfortunately, that Mm -hmm. are health related, injury related. Especially when you start getting on these bigger picture levels with conservation work, sometimes you have to make tough decisions um, to cull animals or let animals die or not. So what would be your advice to people who say, I love animals, I want to work with them, and maybe they don't understand these other aspects? Volunteering. Yeah. You got to get out there and really get into the nitty gritty of it because you're not going to know. And you don't want to, you know, you don't want to go through a bachelor's. So Mm -hmm. you go through four years and then you get to like a field job and you're very disappointed in the fact that. You know, I do get to work with wild animals, and that's really cool, but most of the time, I'm doing observations, Mm -hmm. and I'm not actually collecting things. We collect blood, we collect, you know, measurements, but that's maybe 20% of the job. The rest of it's hiking around and looking for those animals, spending hours and hours doing (laughs) statistical analysis and writing papers and... Just go volunteer as much as you can and then make the decision. It's very physical. It's a lot yes. of labor. <laughs> no matter what field you're in. No. If it involves it's animals, physical. it's pretty physical. And it's all weather. Yes. And you have, to, <laughs> you have to be ready to go through all weather. You have to have correct clothing. You've got to be really knowledgeable. And the only way you get knowledgeable about that is going through it getting dumped on with rain and knowing that you should probably keep a rain jacket in your car in case all of a sudden it rains because that happens and i wouldn't have known that unless it got rained on the first Uh time and and bugs and and bugs yeah bugs and then also snow weather weather things yeah and even when you work with animals well and it's one reason why i'm moving away from mammals not that mammals won't be in my life Mm -hmm. but I'm moving more to working with snakes because it's indoors. Mm -hmm. So when there's a blizzard outside or it's 20 below outside, I can still work with these animals in here. Mm -hmm. When it's 20 below outside and there's a blizzard and you have horses or you have other animals that live outside in zoos or even in a domestic setting, you're out there. You still have to go out there. Every they day. can't not eat mm-hmm. or not have water because there's a blizzard outside or because it's cold. You And if you're sick, it doesn't so matter. Do it. Those animals depend on you and you still have to do it. And as Angie found out when she interned here, there's a lot of physical heavy work involved uh-huh. with zoo animals, agricultural animals, right? Mm, yeah, I lost 30 pounds <laughs> when I was working here. I gained it all back, obviously. I'm going to start a fitness program here and charge people to come lose weight. Because there's hay and grain bags and dog food bags and buckets of water and buckets of feed. And, yes, Angie, man, it was like she was in a fitness fitness camp. (laughs) It really was worse than the Army. Like, I had been, I was in better shape than I've ever been. Working here. (laughs) Well, that's good. Yeah, it was good. good. I know that we had a couple people drop out of the zoo program in school because they didn't realize it was so physical. Yeah, a lot of people did. That was like the number one reason why they dropped out. And that is why I think labs and internships are so important. Because you wouldn't necessarily realize that until you have to go on those lab days and Mm -hmm. do that physical work all day. Or you do those internships where you're actually out there in situ, whether that is in the field in the wild or whether that's in a sanctuary or in a herpetology lab or in a zoo or a shelter 
that's what I mean when I say you're out there in the field doing your internships, you're actually doing the work and you yep. realize what it's like. Yep. So if you're not in a program that has labs and internships, that's where the volunteering is important because mm -hmm. if you don't do that, you're not going to realize what it's like. No, you have no idea. And then you show up and you're <laughs> like, what happened? Why? Yeah. yeah, no, you should, yeah, definitely recommend getting out there. <laughs> so as we wrap up, is there anything else that you want to say? Mm, I don't know. I guess, you know, when you're working with animals or if you want to work with animals, just prepare to be empathetic as well as prepare to kind of cold yourself off to some things and be prepared to be plastic and things change a lot science is changing every day yes. you have to keep up with that so that's like another that's a job on top of a job mm -hmm. so you know make sure you're really ready to commit an emotional commitment and, and then yes. also be prepared emotionally for the sad part of working with animals yes which when I was the coordinator for the community animal response team in Colorado Springs for several years. One of the courses the volunteers had to go through was on stress and um, psychological first aid for your mm -hmm. fellow volunteers who were working these disasters that involved animals because yeah. you want to help, want to help, want to help. And you get out there and you put in all of these long hours and you're rescuing animals from fires, from floods. You're taking them to emergency shelters, you're trying to reunite animals with people, but it ha it takes a psychological toll on you. Yep. And people can get burnt out and depressed. And that happens in every animal field, not just in those circumstances, but even working in a zoo or at a vet or at a sanctuary or just anytime you work with animals, that's gonna be an aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's my tip. Mm -hmm. Be prepared, not only physically, but psychologically, to deal with a whole gambit of yeah. emotions. Yeah, a lot. I mean, have you run into situations in the field where, like, you've come upon an animal that's injured, and you're like, oh, I want to take it home and help it, but you can't? All the time. It yeah. happens all the baby prairie dogs, you know, a lot of, of baby coyotes. We just, saw, we just saw a baby coyote that had had its leg broken from getting hit by a car oh no and you can't do anything you can't take it it's illegal you can't wow. do anything now there are wildlife rehabbers here there in are and we, and we call so how does one that one. work so the will you call them but unfortunately because it's an army chemical it's an army depot oh where you're doing the work yeah they were not permitted to come on at that time and we lost track of the oh, coyote pup no. and we don't really know what happened Oh. But that stuff does happen. There's a cougar that probably ate it, and it's a circle of life. And right. that's really what it is. But if you come upon a situation like that, sometimes there are wildlife rehab yes. institutions or individuals that yes. can help that animal and then either keep it at a sanctuary or re-release it mm -hmm. into the wild. Yep, just Google local wildlife rehabbers. And but that's not out. always going to be possible, no. and sometimes you have to let things be. Yep. You can only do what you can do. I know. Well, Angie, thank you so much for joining me. This is my first interview for the channel. I do want to do interviews if they're helpful and pertinent to the animal community. And I think you had a lot to offer people. Thanks. <laughs> well, you're empathetic to animals. You've worked really, really hard to get where you're at. Yeah. And I think that, that those kind of stories help people. The, hearing those kinds of things from just regular people, mm -hmm. it helps others. You know, not give so. up. <laughs> yeah, don't give up. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for spending that time with Angie and I and watching this first interview for my channel. Occasionally, I will do other interviews like this. If you'd like to contact Angie, you can do that through Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary by visiting their website, spiritkeeperequine.org, and filling out a contact form, or you can email spiritkeeperequinesanctuary at gmail.com and just put that that is attention to Angie. Thank you again so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.